Uh, greetings, friends, and welcome to Trenton 365. Big shout out to all of you who've been following and sharing and supporting the program. We really appreciate it. Big shout out to WIMG 1300. We have won another Stella Gospel Music Award. So big shout out to everyone who voted for us. And that is where Trenton 365 got started. And Trenton 365 is civic engagement radio, encouraging you to be a part of building the community that you want. And building that community comes in all different shapes and sizes as diverse as who we are as people. But we all realize that together, we can provide this opportunity for us to come together, build some awesome stuff because we see it on a regular basis. Part of that has to do with how we physically feel. And that means we have to take good care of what we put into our bodies so that we can get wonderful things out of our bodies. Now, I am someone, I eat almost everything. There's very few things that I don't enjoy and I'm blessed and I'm thankful because I'm able to do that. But I know that there are a lot of other people who don't have that ability. And there's folks I know, or even my family, so to speak, who are considering going all plant-based or, or have transitioned already. So there's lots of different products and things that are coming out onto the marketplace that are you know, snacks and different types of food that are plant-based and environmental friendly, et cetera. And I'm going to be reaching out to a bunch of them. But one of them I'm bringing on to the air now. And this is Moku Foods. Now, Moku Foods, um, I can't recall exactly where I came across the product, but it was, of course, on probably one of the social media platforms. And I reached out to them and I got hooked up with Matt Feldman of Moku Foods. Matt, thank you so much for some of your time here sharing with the audience. How about you introduce yourself and then let's get into talking about food and Moku Foods. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jack. Uh, yeah, so I'm Matt Feldman. I'm the founder and CEO of Moku Foods. And Moku is a, a jerky, like a beef jerky, but instead of beef, it's made from mushrooms. And I started Moku in 2019 after going vegan, um, after watching a couple documentaries on Netflix. And as I was shifting to a plant-based diet, um, I was you know, looking for an alternative to beef jerky, something to keep me full throughout the day, something savory, delicious, nutrient-dense. And I noticed there were no options for someone like myself, but I also really enjoy the taste of meat and I didn't want to compromise on an alternative like impossible foods or beyond meat because I eat clean um, and I look at the labels and, ing and ingredients of what I put in my body. And for those products, um, they do compromise on ke with chemicals and high saturated fats and a highly processed product. Whereas for myself, um, I'm very um, conscious of what I put in my body. So when I started Moku, I wanted to keep those very clean guidelines and create a meat alternative that didn't compromise on taste or ingredients. Um, so when we developed the, the Moku jerky made from mushrooms, we kept um, a clean label. So, you know, uh, king oyster mushrooms plus plant-based clean ingredients that, you know, one can pronounce. Um, but I'm also intolerant to both gluten and soy. So I kept both of those off the ingredient label so that anyone can eat the snack and enjoy it. You know, Matt, um, as I'm taking my notes here, you know, in my research, you know, I, I, I want you to, to touch back on, um, we're going to get into the details about you, but I want to touch back on the types of mushrooms. Um, because I think that, um, especially how I grew up, we're only usually given a few options of what those mushrooms are, but mushrooms, there's a lot of diversity and lots of different varieties. So you, can you just chat a bit more about the types of mushrooms that you've chosen? Yeah, so we, we only use king oyster mushrooms, which are the long, uh, the big ones that are used in a lot of restaurants, but they're very meaty. They have a stock, um, which you know restaurants will cut up and, and cook to emulate meat. But for us, we found that the king oysters um, gave us the best chance of really mimicking that meat texture. But like you said, there are a ton of different mushrooms out there. Most people are familiar with the button mushrooms, but there's shiitake, there's maitake, which is um, definitely one that tastes like meat. There's portabella, king oyster, um, blue oyster. There's, there's so many. And if I'm sure if you go to your local farmer's market, you can, you can find a variety. And a big shout out to all of our farmer's markets out there because they, they are a wonderful institution 
that um, I think more and more people are becoming more aware of them. And I'm a big fan of encouraging people to be, you know, grow whatever you can in whatever space that you can. Um, now I want to spin back and talk a bit about you as a person, like making that choice and that decision to go vegan. Um, there's a lot of questions um, people have about, you know, how we have been developed as a society to be a meat-based culture. And I'd like for you to just uh, talk about your experience and touch on that too a bit if you can. Yeah, of course. Um, so I grew up here in Honolulu, Hawaii, which, you know, is a small chain of islands. And from an early age, I, I always really cared about the environment. And I think growing up on an island, we just have to be a little more conscious of our choices and how it affects both the island and the earth in general, because we don't have unlimited space. So that was always in the back of my mind. And I knew when I would start a business, eventually I wanted to incorporate sustainability in it. So fast forward, um, I was living in San Francisco and um, I, I came across a documentary called Cowspiracy, which was, which talked about the environmental impact of the beef industry and the meat industry in general. And um, at the time I had also, you know, read a bunch of articles about how, you know, people were, or companies were burning down forests for space to raise cattle and um, to do the industrial beef production. And um, it was very apparent that, you know, that practice was um, contributing negatively to the environment. And so when I started, you know, I decided to, to try plant-based for two weeks and see how I would feel. And, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's for everyone. People have certain conditions or um, intolerances or allergens or whatever it might be for their body that may not allow them to eat fully plant-based. But for me, it worked out physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, I was good in all those areas. So for me, it was an easy change. Um, but I had access to, you know, farmer's markets and, and, and grocery stores that had, you know, good produce and everything, which most, which a lot of people don't have access to. So I was fortunate in that way to have the access to, you know, cook, you know, healthy and delicious plant-based meals. But it was there where I, you know, made the shift and, um, and then I started learning about mushrooms and mushrooms are, you know, obviously very healthy. They grow very sustainably a lot of the times indoors, which is where our mushrooms grow. Um, and they just require a lot less resources and they do a lot less damage on the environment than uh, um, a, a food like beef. So for me, I was, you know, the light bulb kind of went off and I said, okay, you know, I'm already shifted to this plant-based lifestyle. I'm looking for an alternative to jerky. Maybe there's more people like this, like me that are also looking for an alternative, whether, whether they're, you know, they're just trying to add one day of their week of eating plant-based, whether they're vegan, vegetarian, or just like the taste of mushrooms and want a snack that is better for the environment. So that was a bunch of factors like that kind of led me to start Moku. We now, when we consider, you know, the the food preparation portion of a diet, right? Uh, you know, that's a word that jumped out to me. Um, so, the product is rich, it's nutritious, it's dense, it's packaged, so it can be taken on the go, just like I would assume any other jerky. Um, do you find that that people are are using this, like incorporating it into their fitness lifestyle, even if they are not? Um, you know, vegan or, you know, full plant-based diet folks? Yeah, you know, it was interesting because when we launched, we didn't know if this would be a, like a popular snack for vegans, if this would be a popular snack for people that were shifting away from meat. But what, we, what we've learned in the first eight months of selling the product is that most of the people who continuously buy it um, are just looking for a delicious, savory snack, whether they're vegan, whether they eat meat, whether they love beef jerky or not. Um, it just so happens that there are not that many nutritious, savory snacks. You have, you know, your chips, your popcorn, your nuts. And then on the sweet side, you have bars, which, you know, have all the macros. But for savory, there aren't a lot of, um, you know, like nutrient dense snacks out there. So Moku fits that need for a lot of people. Um, there's nine grams of fiber in each bag, which, you know, most Americans are don't get enough fiber. Um, there's six grams of protein per bag, which isn't a huge amount, but it's definitely adds, you know, protein to your, your day. And, and I think most people eat Moku in between meals, um, something to keep them full throughout the day, but also people throw it in their, in different recipes and on pizza, on Mac and cheese, on salads, on stir fries, 
Um, it's also a really good snack, you know, after the gym or after a workout of some sort, um, you know, to get filled up because, or going on a hike because food being high in fiber definitely keeps you full. So all you need is one bag and, um, like it'll, it'll definitely keep you full in between meals. All right. So as, as, as I'm taking my notes here, you know, my mouth is watering, you know, thinking about <laughs> this. So I want you to take us through a, um, a flavor profile. Cause I know you have a few different fla flavors, take yeah. us through the flavor profile and what people can expect when they try, uh, the Moku jerk. Yeah. So first I'll just mention that when I started it, I have no culinary background and I was able to produce a product that was okay. I would say most people liked it. Like it wasn't anything that people thought would, you know, be a replacement for beef jerky, but <laughs> knowing that I, I partnered with two renowned chefs early on and it took about 18 months because we went through one um, process to get the product to an unbelievable level, but it wasn't necessarily scalable from a manufacturing point of view. So then we went back into development and worked with another, um, you know, famous culinary expert, and he took it to the next level in order to be scalable. So we went through over a hundred iterations during these 18 months. And our goal was to create a product that tasted as much like meat as possible, because our goal is to make it easier for people to shift to a mushroom or a plant-based product rather than have an alternative just for vegans. Because for myself, like I miss the taste of meat. And I wanted to create a product that was easy to shift to and without having to compromise on, on, on taste, on ingredient label, on the environment, things like that. So just to, just wanted to mention that we went through a lot of iterations to get where, to where we are today. And we continuously make improvements um, as we go on. But the three flavors that we have today is an original, which is like a normal, tastes like a normal beef jerky. We have a Hawaiian teriyaki, which is a little sweeter. You have some pineapple and ginger in there. And then we have a sweet and spicy, which um, is the fan favorite. And this is, we, we have uh, maple sugar as well as cayenne pepper to add like a sweet and, and spicy uh, kick to it. So I'm sitting here, man, and, I, and I'm, I'm going through my mind thinking about the various different types of jerky I've had over the time. And I, I, I would say that Within the last five years or so, I think that there's been a lot of promotion behind typical types of beef jerky and maybe even some variations with going into other type of meat jerkies. Um, is, is there a strong um, competition in the, in the plant-based vegan community or is it that, you know, this is something that is really a burgeoning opportunity? Yeah, you know, when we launched, there weren't too many vegan jerkies, and, and that, that was only eight months ago. Um, so we were easily able to become the top mushroom jerky on Amazon um, and are probably doing the best out of all of them. Um, there's, a, there's a couple soy jerkies, which do decent, but as we've seen with, like in the alternative milk category, people are shifting away from soy. So we didn't want to, you know, have a soy in our product just for the people that were allergic to it or, or didn't eat it. So um, we stuck to mushrooms. And the thing is, people that hate mushrooms still love our product because it doesn't taste anything like mushrooms. So whether you like mushrooms and, you know, want to try a product that tastes like meat or you hate mushrooms and still want to try a product that tastes like meat, like this is for everyone. Um, but in terms of the competition, um, there are a bunch of like hybrid snacks coming out, like plant-based pork rinds, which I feel like we more compete with because they're high in protein, high in fiber. Um, whereas the vegan jerkies, we definitely spent the most time and resources to, to perfect it. Um, and the category is so small. Like we, we honestly hope more brands launch vegan jerkies so that more people have eyes on the category because we know we'll get seen. Um, but it's still very small. Um, the amount of people that are searching for vegan jerky is still very low. And um, yeah, it's definitely a growing category. We see new brands popping into the space, you know, ever since we launched. So um, it's definitely growing though. Cool. Now, I don't know if you uh, can share any details about um, the chefs that have been a part of this. Are you able to share a, a bit about who they are and about some of the processes, um, some of the experiences, et cetera? Yeah. So Thomas Bowman was the first guy that we worked with. And Thomas led the product and development for um, a company called Just. They make a plant-based egg. 
and they're about to go public um, soon. But he developed, he led the development for all of their products. And when I met him, I, you know, bought him lunch and was just trying to pick his brain since I was new to the industry. And it just so happened that he was leaving the company and had time to work with me on my product. So I was super stoked about that. And he really helped it get to the next level early on um, and kind of get to level one. And then once we got there, um, we, we realized that we needed to do more work on development so that the product can be scaled out of a, a manufacturing facility. And um, then we came across a guy named Ali Buzari, who uh, he runs a uh, product development firm called Pilot RD. And we worked with him and his firm to, again, take it to the next level so that we can make, instead of hundreds of bags, we can make thousands of bags at a time. So Ali um, is well known in the food industry, Forbes 30 under 30. He's one of the best, I would say, product developers in the country, as is Thomas. So I would say like we, we, we were fortunate to work with two of the top experts um, to and, and Ali and Ali did a lot of work and studied, you know, how barbecue and, and meats are made and, and incorporated a lot of those same practices into how he developed Moku in order to get the flavor to really soak into the mushrooms without being sticky um, and the texture to come up, come across as, um, you know, similar to beef jerky with that chew. So a lot of work in both the flavor and the texture for the product. You know, part of what I like to do here is to encourage folks to, you know, reach out to my guests, but also to have conversations with them, um, like you did um, with uh, Thomas and Allie, um, and find out, hey, how can I get some support in this? How can I get some questions? Um, I'm asking this because I'd like for you to talk about the importance of coming out of your com comfort zone and recognizing that you can't do it all by yourself. And you have to find people who strategically you can partner with. Absolutely. And I, I came into this, not like you said, not having a network or experience in the food industry. So the one thing uh, that I think that I'm really good at is networking and, and meeting people and um, gaining knowledge from people that I don't know. And it's so important. And there's so much access there online with LinkedIn and people don't realize how how willing people are to help if you reach out and, and ask for their time. So what I did was um, I used LinkedIn. So I essentially added founders and CEOs and chefs on LinkedIn and basically just commented on their work, whatever they were doing, mentioning how it was impressive and just showing that I cared and did some research on them. And then I asked for 10 minutes of their time, whether it was for coffee or a chat. And the ones that saw the message, most of them took, took the time. And once I got that phone call, you know, I, I picked their brain on some questions and then they asked me some questions and, and then they, you know, offered to introduce me to someone else and it just snowballs from there. But it starts with that, you know, outreach to people you don't know, um, going to events, like you've really got to put yourself out there, especially if you're not an industry veteran or have experience in the field. Um, so I think it's important for people getting a job, people starting a business, like whatever they're doing, like. I think it's vital that they need to really put their put themselves out there and, and, and connect with people that are in the industry. Mm -hmm. That's what now, I did. Great. And I wanted to talk to you about social media. I know you touched on it a little bit by by mentioning uh, LinkedIn. And, um, you know, for the folks who don't use LinkedIn, uh, think of it as like a, an adult's version of um, Facebook sort of, you know, and really your professional background. And I've noticed that there's a lot of folks who are in business but aren't involved in, in LinkedIn. And uh, you initially mentioned that. So can you talk about, again, LinkedIn, the importance of that and the other social media platforms where Moco Foods is uh, being highlighted and spotlighted? Yeah, and LinkedIn is just a professional network. So it's like if you have a corporate job or you own a business or whatever it might be, like those people already have LinkedIn profiles and they normally check it. So that to me was the easiest way to um, get people to see my messages. But the same practice can be made in other channels like Instagram. Um, if, if you find the person on Instagram, you know, maybe DMing them, commenting on their posts so that they see you doing whatever you can to get their attention. Facebook, um, I guess could also be used. I feel like young people aren't on Facebook anymore, but, um, 
yeah, TikTok, you can't message people directly unless they follow you. So that's a little tougher. So I would say using Instagram and LinkedIn are the, probably the two best social channels to get people's attention and, and get meetings on the calendar. Great. Now I'm speaking with, with Matt Feldman, who is the founder and CEO of Moku Foods, which is a plant-based jerky. Um, it's made of mushrooms. Um, and, uh, you know, Matt, I'd like for you to, um, th there's always going to be those people in there, you know, in the audience who are, eh, eh, I'm not really into that. You know, um, I, I, I like my meat. I like this. Can you just walk them through one more time? What is different about Moku Foods? Yeah, I would say like, we're not here to tell you that meat is bad for you because I think it all depends on where your meat's coming from and, and what's in it and all that. It's very subjective to talk about health. But one thing that people won't argue, argue with is the environmental impact that the, that the meat industry, specifically the beef industry has on the planet. And as you've seen with the Amazon burning and you know the, the space they need to carve out to um, sustain cattle farming, it's, it's people are eating more and more meat around the world, especially in developing countries. So there's so much, so many trees and forests that are being burnt to make room for this. And mushrooms are such a good alternative to, to meat if cooked in the right way. Um, they don't have as much protein, but they have fiber. They have a ton of B and D vitamins. They're so healthy for you. They can be made so much more sustainably. So our, our, our thing was just to make it easier for people to switch by providing a, a tasty snack. Um, our price is a little more than beef jerky now, but eventually it'll be even more affordable. Um, but whether you like beef jerky or not, this is just a delicious snack that you know is nutritious. Um, it'll get you through your day. You won't have to compromise on the environment on, you know, if you're into animal ethics, if you're into ingredients, you don't have to compromise on any of that. It's just a delicious, nutritious snack that will keep you full throughout the day. So that's what we're creating at Moku. We, we're starting with jerky. We're going to cre be creating more sustainable, delicious snacks as we grow. Um, but jerky is our first product. And yeah, we want to get it into as many hands as possible. Awesome. Matt Feldman, founder and CEO of Moku Foods. Stay tuned. I'm going to be sharing more about Moku Foods and this wonderful jerky once I get my hands on some of it. Matt, thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you, Jock. Pleasure to be on, man. All right. There you have it, folks. Moku Foods, a uh, guest here on Trenton 365. It's all about encouraging folks to think about how we can work together to build a better community for everyone and introducing each other to different products and things that come down our way. Jacques Howard here reminding you it's always about justice, peace, and humility.